Today I have an exciting treat for you as we dive into the care and other details when it comes to Brassicatlia amethyst. This video was inspired by Jagadish Kumar, who commented on my shorts video that this orchid deserves its own spotlight video. So, I will cover how I care for my amethyst and semi-hydroponics as well as the alternatives if organic media is your jam with a wet-dry cycle. Get ready to be captivated by its uniqueness and beauty. Thank you for being here. I hope that this video encourages you to consider adding an amethyst to your collection. In my opinion, its vibrant colors and striking patterns make it a must-have for any orchid collector. Or, if you already have an amethyst and are not certain about some care details, I hope that this video will clear those up. And if it does not succeed in doing that, then please bring that to my attention in the comments and I look forward to helping out with any specifics pertaining to your environment. First of all, some fascinating facts about this stunning orchid. Brassocatlia amethyst is a primary hybrid, the parents being Catlia purpurata and Brassavola cuculata. If you are into elegant blooms that have a touch of the exotic, this is a breathtaking orchid with both parents loving a wet and tropical environment, depending on which purpurata it is crossed with. However, no matter if the purpurata is from the highlands or the lowlands, the fact that the purpurata parent allows for some leeway when it comes to the ideal conditions this orchid would thrive in, makes it an orchid that is relatively easy to grow. My temperature range for this orchid, which I am cultivating in Lekka and self-watering, is 15 degrees degrees Celsius all the way to 40 degrees Celsius, which does not happen often, but it can happen. It is in those warm conditions that I have my amethyst in bright shade all the time. And during these perfect conditions, my amethyst goes glam camping on the east side of the patio on the rack behind a white curtain, where it gets blasted with light from end of spring to mid-fall, and then it has to endure the low light levels of my winter holding space, where I do not supplement with artificial light. If the conditions are ideal with warmer temperatures no lower than 20 degrees Celsius all year round, this orchid does not have a rest period and would continuously throw out new growths. My amethyst started a new growth mid-winter, which did not amount to much, had another one starting early spring, which is now blooming. At the same time, it activated its third lead, but that lead is still too young to bloom, so hopefully in 2024 we'll get another lead to bloom out. And also, while in bloom, another new growth is on the way, which is going to mature during the ideal conditions that I'll have left here in southern Spain. So you can see that this orchid is pretty vigorous once it is established and gets growing. It took me four years to bloom this orchid and she graduated into a blooming size orchid in 2022 with a single bloom that had me doing cartwheels around the patio. Seeing as my winter conditions are not ideal for this orchid, I had resorted to accepting that I may not be able to bloom this orchid because of the lack of light. So yeah, <laughs> when in 2022 she bloomed for the first time, cartwheels were a thing. Now that she has bloomed right on time two years in a row with two blooms this time, methinks that I will be able to keep her safe during the winters in the future. I have to be careful with that statement though because if you look at the thin base of every pseudobulb, cold and wet media, pot surface, etc. can take this orchid out very quickly. I have lost some growth because the base was turning black when I had a lot more moss around the rhizome. But the repot early this year took care of that and now I'm keeping that moss at bay even though it used to be a great humidity buffer preventing the pot from drying out too fast on the surface which could take out new roots. New roots on anything to do with Brassavola are super important because in a sense they are not generous root growers but it is the purpurata parent here that makes them a little less sensitive so it's working out well for this orchid to hold on to its roots over a period of time, not be stingy on the root growth Still, there is a little bit of caution with regards to the roots of this orchid. While every single root on every single orchid is precious, <laughs> in this case, even more so. So these are the little things that could make or break a successful cultivation and successful blooming of the amethyst. And if you were to grow this orchid in bark with a wet dry cycle, the same principles would apply. Keep the rhizome proud of the media and avoid excessive humidity or wet media during the cooler temperatures. That is, if the 20 degrees Celsius minimum cannot be achieved. No matter the setup though, 
When it comes to this orchid being in active growth, she needs to be watered often enough for the media to not dry out. This is easy to achieve in the self-watering setup, however with bark and wet dry cycle what you do not want to do is leave the media to dry out for too long. If you look at the structure of this orchid you will recognize that while it is drought tolerant when in active growth and not getting the ideal supply of water or nutrients it will start absorbing energy from other structures resulting in weakening the orchid. It is not an easy feat to rescue this orchid once it's weakened. There's nothing the orchid can work with if the older structures were to a rot out or b desiccate because the energy is being drawn to the growing point. In my setup I am giving this orchid 500 parts per million two times per month. I prefer to keep more plain RO water in the reservoir so as not to have any salt accumulation in the pot or on the surface of the pot. So once the orchid has absorbed the nutrients in the reservoir I fill it up again with plain RO water every time just making sure that I do fill the reservoir up with 500 parts per million two times per month. Even if in active growth during the winter I do not fertilize this heavily. Because of my conditions I keep it nice and low at 100 parts per million. However then the reservoir always has 100 parts per million throughout the winter and early spring. Flushing in between adding the nutrients is a given. So if you grow your amethyst in bark or intend to do so then your amethyst is able to tolerate temperatures as low as 13 degrees Celsius as long as the media is dry for most of the time. But keep in mind the care of an actively growing amethyst during cooler temperatures needs to be gentle fertilizing with regular flushing being preferred when it comes to watering. And once again just to specify the cooler temperatures I just mentioned anything below 20 degrees Celsius if this orchid is in active growth be conservative with the fertilizer or on the side of caution preferably a little bit more flushing just to avoid salts in the pot taking out the roots. And then know that a new growth that grows during the months when conditions are not ideal while it may not bloom it will grow roots and this orchid needs a lot of structures and roots before it has the energy and strength to bloom and I say that because according to the tag when I bought it my orchid was near blooming size that was four years before it actually bloomed but then ta-da! now that you have it in bloom well throughout the commentary we gawked at the blooms and I hope that you enjoyed the sight but just look at this beauty the amethyst boasts large exquisite flowers with rich purple hues and delicate veining its lip showcases a contrasting magenta color adding an extra touch of allure these blooms are truly a sight to behold it has inherited the veining and stripes within the lips of the bloom from the purpurata parent and then the exotic extensions of the petals and sepals as well as the elongated lip from the cuculata. The amethyst has also inherited the beautiful rose fragrance of the purpurata parent which is fragrant during the day but because the cuculata parent being nocturnally fragrant these blooms continued maintaining that rose fragrance well into the night. As I do not have a cuculata I cannot speak on the fragrance of those blooms I am assuming it would match a similar fragrance to my other brassavola species which is akin to lemon sugar but the lemon note is more along the lines of the fragrance that lemon essential oils exude. I do love that fragrance in itself by the way but then I do have purpuratas and they have a gorgeous rose fragrance of sorts. Some purpuratas are more intense than others in their fragrance but my amethyst has more of the rose fragrance than anything lemony. If you have an amethyst and you have had your amethyst bloom out would you let me know in the comments what your experience of that fragrance is and is yours also fragrant at night? I would appreciate that additional information and I'm sure anybody else looking for additional information would love to have a different opinion and experience from others who have bloomed out amethysts. Thank you so so much for that. Now if you can get a variety that has a lot more contrast between the purple, magenta and the white. The blooms are even more impressive. Mine tend to stay on the lighter side. They only show a bit more color when the bloom has just opened. Another nice little feature of those blooms which they have inherited from the cuculata parent is that they increase in size over several days until they reach their full size which is when they really resemble the cuculata shaped bloom. But yeah, mine is a little bit on the pale side, so you can see that no matter the amount of light I've been throwing at this orchid, 
this is what she does and it's her second blooming so i have a variety that's a little bit paler if you can get your hands on one where the magenta is much more pronounced on the petals and sepals it is an even more impressive bloom in my dry climate when this orchid blooms my lack of humidity makes the tender petals and sepals dry out relatively quickly usually the blooms would last three weeks without showing signs of decline thanks to the purpurata parent but for that to be the case across the board, the humidity should also be around 85%. Then the breeze won't frazzle the blooms prematurely. Mine looks pristine for about a week. <laughs> and then because I know the orchid is okay, I just leave them on even if they don't look that remarkable anymore. But the first week, that is when the blooms absolutely look their best. Thanks to my warm, dry winds, I get the frazzle relatively quickly. And there you have it, a brief but comprehensive look into the enchanting Brassicatlia amethyst. From its vibrant blooms to its care requirements, this orchid truly stands out as a gem in the world of orchids, in my opinion, and probably Yagadish saw it and said, you need to do a spotlight on it. Here you are, Yagadish. I hope that the information was useful, and I also hope for anybody else watching that the information was useful. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and share it with fellow orchid aficionados. That also would be the hat trick that YouTube loves so much, which supports the channel immensely. Also, check out the playlist on my channel, in which you will find a whole library of detailed information about orchid growing, the ups and the downs. <laughs> <laughs> this video was a pleasure to put together. Bloom videos always are because dem blooms are our reward for 11 months of care. And then putting a video featuring an orchid in bloom together is another opportunity to stop and focus on the beauty for a little longer. Thank you for the request, Jagadish. I appreciate that very much. And thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a beautiful day, but I always attach a condition to that, that you stay safe. I would love to see you in the next video or in any of the videos that I have already posted on my channel. Take care. Bye.